Welcome everyone to the next in our series of summer webinars where we do uh, a 15 minute question dissection, typically a high yield step one question with many uh, clinical uh, correlates and many important areas to explore many connections to make. My name is Ken Rubin. I am one of the senior most medical instructors at Med School Tutors. I'm also a recent graduate of the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. For those of you who have attended these webinars in the past, we are absolutely thrilled to have you back. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed them and, and hope that you will enjoy tonight's. And for those of you out there who haven't attended a webinar yet, we are also are extremely pleased that you're here. We hope that you'll find this discussion uh, instructive and uh, a good use of your time. Let's go ahead and get started. Here's the question that we have. This is a, a typical step one question. Um, going to be about hematology, specifically hemoglobin and its relationship to oxygen and carbon dioxide, the transport of these gases in blood. We're going to go ahead and read the question out loud together. Clinical research study is investigating, a physiologic, uh, investigating physiologic parameters during exercise. After running on a treadmill for several minutes, blood is drawn from an artery and a vein in the arm. What effect best explains why mixed venous blood can carry more carbon dioxide than arterial blood for a given PCO2. Before we go and, and start looking at the answer choices, it's very important when looking at a, a step one question, when reading a question on the USMLE, to make sure that we read the question carefully and we know what it's asking. So we want to read it very closely because all the reasoning work that we do, if it's not leading to, if it's not based on what the question is asking, it's going to lead us to the wrong direction. So in this question, the key for us is to recognize that we're talking about carbon dioxide. The question that we have here is what effect best explains why venous blood can carry more carbon dioxide than arterial blood for a given PCO2. This is important to highlight because most of the time when we're talking about binding of gases to hemoglobin and gas transport in the blood, we're talking about oxygen. We're talking about how hemoglobin relates to oxygen. But in this case, the question is asking us to look at this from a different angle, from the point of view of CO2, and that's going to be very important to keep in mind. But before we go and analyze the choices one by one, it is important to do a basic review of gas exchange and also how CO2 and NO2 are related to hemoglobin and how they're carried in blood. So let's go ahead and do that. Here we have CO2. It's important to understand how CO2 is transported in blood. And there are really three ways that we want to think about CO2 being transported in blood. One of those ways is directly bound to hemoglobin in the red blood cell. That's not really a method of transport that we think about that often, but it is important and it's specifically for this question. Carbon dioxide can be transported in blood bound to hemoglobin, but that only represents a small fraction of carbon dioxide transport. Carbon dioxide is also transported in blood. When carbon dioxide released from muscle cells, from metabolically active tissue, is released into the blood, it combines with water uh, to form carbonic acid, but some of that CO2 does not react at all. And some of that CO2 will stay dissolved in the, the blood, and that's where we get this idea of uh, partial pressure, or the, the PaCO2. But if we remember our basic biochemistry and our general chemistry, we understand that very little CO2 is able to be dissolved in blood. Well, why is that the case? The answer is that CO2 is a nonpolar gas, as is oxygen. And nonpolar gases don't dissolve well in aqueous environments, which blood is. Plasma is, is highly aqueous. So very little CO2 is going to be dissolved in plasma, just as very little CO2 will be bound to hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin. If that's the case, then how is carbon dioxide predominantly transported in blood? And the answer is it's transported as bicarbonate. And this equation that we have represented here is a very fundamental equation for the USMLE. And this is something that you guys out there have, have seen many times. We've seen this going back to basic science years, but it is important to constantly refresh our understanding of what this means and the many implications, which become greater as our understanding of medicine increases. 
basically what this is saying is that carbon dioxide in blood combines with water to form carbonic acid, a weak acid, and this will dissociate into bicarbonate and H+. We have dual arrows in this reaction, representing that, that the reaction can go both ways, but the key here is that CO2, if we can make it, if we can turn a nonpolar gas into a polar charged uh, substance, we're able to transport a high volume of uh, the CO2 in plasma. And of course, you know, we also have H+, and you want to think about CO2 as interchangeable with H+, when it comes time for acid-base considerations, which go beyond the scope of what we're going to focus on here. To give you more of an idea of the importance of this, let's consider the, the, the location, uh, the predominant location of this reaction, which we said is the red blood cell. Now, you may look at this, uh, this donut-like image here and think, well, why is there a donut uh, on the screen during this hemoglobin presentation? Of course, this isn't a donut. This is a red blood cell. We notice the biconcave shape. And the point is that this is very, very important for the red blood cell. What does this have to do with a red blood cell? Well, the key to understanding that is understanding where the carbon dioxide comes from in the first place. And what you see on the screen right here is a sample muscle. This is the biceps muscle. And we know that muscle is very metabolically active. We know that the muscle cells are constantly using a lot of energy to contract. And in order to generate that energy, they need to do a lot of cell respiration, specifically aerobic respiration. And, and what does that mean? Well, that means that muscle cells need a rich supply of blood flow with a lot of glucose and oxygen. And they will burn that glucose using oxygen, forming as waste products water and coincidentally CO2. So tissues like muscle are producing a lot of CO2. The thing is, we need to get rid of that CO2, and that is the, the key that we have to focus on here. How do we get rid of that CO2 that's being produced by muscle? We do that by, as we said, transporting it in blood. And so the idea here is that the CO2 that we're producing will be turned into bicarbonate. That bicarbonate will be transported along with the red blood cell to the lungs, where we're eventually going to breathe out the CO2 through our lungs, through our airways. One thing that we haven't talked about yet is what exactly happens to the bicarbonate once it's created. So we know it's created by carbonic anhydrase, anhydrase in the cell, but what happens to it? Well, that HCO3 minus, that bicarb, is going to be sent out of the red blood cell in exchange for another negatively charged ion, namely chloride. So bicarb goes out and chloride goes in. The question we have to ask ourselves, though, is if bicarb goes out, what happens to the H plus? And it's important for us to send the H plus someplace because that is how we drive the reaction forward. Now, you guys, going back to basic science years and, and first and second year, you may remember learning about Le Chatelier's principle uh, governing the direction of reactions. The names are not important. We don't care about you knowing the names of things. We care about you understanding how things work and getting the right answer on your USMLE. So what happens, though, is if we're able to send the bicarb and the, the H plus acid somewhere to remove it from the reaction, we're able to drive the reaction to the right. So that's going to allow us to take more and more CO2 and convert it to bicarb. One half of the equation, as we said, is setting the bicarb out of the cell, but the other half is taking the H plus and, and sending it someplace inside of the cell. Well, where does that H plus go? Predominantly, the H plus is going to bind to hemoglobin. And this is an important point that's often overlooked. The hemoglobin in the red blood cell not only can bind oxygen, which we, we know about, but it also can bind CO2, as we described before, that's the carbamino hemoglobin, and hemoglobin can bind H plus. So we want to keep that in mind to come back to later. Going back to our loop here that we're forming, the CO2 is breathed out in the lungs, and of course we breathe in oxygen. That's the gas exchange uh, occurring at the alveolar capillary interface in the lung and blood. That oxygen will be sent to the, the muscle and the arterial circulation, and that is our big loop. Okay, so the next thing we want to do in our review of hemoglobin and gas exchange is figure out the interplay of oxygen and carbon dioxide with hemoglobin. What's important to understand is that even though oxygen binds tightly to hemoglobin, the, uh, the CO2 that's in the area, specifically in the red blood cell, also has a very important effect on how oxygen can bind to hemoglobin, and let's explore that graphically. 
Now this is very important what we're going to do in the next couple of minutes. We're going to be looking at some graphs that relate gases to concentrations in serum and also hemoglobin. And being able to interpret graphs properly on the USMLE is a vital skill. And more than interpreting graphs that, that we've seen or that we're familiar with, is being able to interpret graphical data that we have not seen. Because sometimes they're going to give us something that you know is, is unfamiliar and that's intentional. The US Emily wants to see that we can use our basic understanding of the content to apply it to unfamiliar uh, presentations. So in this case over here, we have oxygen content on the y-axis. This is measuring oxygen content in blood. And we have PaO2, or the partial pressure of oxygen on uh, the horizontal axis. And again, partial pressure of oxygen is telling us how much oxygen gas is dissolved in plasma. Now we can infer that the relationship would be somewhat positive. The greater the oxygen concentration in blood, the greater the partial pressure, and therefore the greater the content. And in fact, we do see a positive uh, relationship, but of course we have this weird shape. This shape though is something that should be familiar to all of you out there. We've seen this. This is the classic sigmoidal binding curve, the implications of which we're going to hold off on for now. Now an interesting question is what does CO2 do to the curve? Well CO2, as, as many of you know, will shift the curve to the right. And what does that mean? That means that when we have CO2 bound to hemoglobin, when we have CO2 in rich amounts in the red blood cell, it's going to make it harder for hemoglobin to bind to oxygen. It's going to lower the oxygen content in blood. We need a higher PaO2 to achieve the same level of oxygen content. But the thing is, it's not just CO2 that's doing this. It's also H+. Both of these substances bind to hemoglobin and change hemoglobin's affinity to oxygen. Many of you know this as the Bohr effect, but like Le Chatelier's principle, the name of the effect is not important for the USMLE. That, leave that for the professors in courses. We want to understand how things work, so let's press on with our graphical interpretation. Now we're going to look at the other side of this. We're going to look at CO2. So CO2 is also bound to hemoglobin. We said that before. And as with the first relationship, oxygen has an inverse type effect. And let's explore that effect graphically. On the y-axis, we have carbon dioxide content. Again, this is maybe a presentation that you have not seen, but that's okay. You're going to use your understanding to make sense of it. On the horizontal axis, we have partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And as with the oxygen relationship, we can infer, logically, that as the partial pressure of CO2 will increase in blood, probably the CO2 content would go up as well. And that is what we see. Now, anyone who's paying attention here is going to notice that the, the shape of the graph is different here from what we had before. Before, we had the classic sigmoidal shape. And for carbon dioxide, though, we have a directly linear shape. And you want to ask yourself why that's the case. OK, well, what happens when we have some oxygen on board? What happens when oxygen is binding to hemoglobin in addition to CO2 in the red cell. Well, this is what happens. The curve is going to shift to the right. Let's pause here to, to fully understand the implications of this. What this is saying is that when oxygen concentrations are high, per, uh, for a given partial pressure of CO2, the CO2 overall content in blood will drop. So when oxygen is high in the red blood cell, the CO2 content will drop. And if you remember what we said before, we said that the majority of CO2 is carried how? Well, we said it's carried as bicarb. So if we're putting the pieces together, we could say that the more oxygen you have in red blood cells, the less bicarb we're able to transport in blood for a given pCO2. So let that think in and get the wheels turning because we will exactly need that type of uh, inferential thinking for answering the question. So before we get back to the question, and, and, and these answer choices are going to be tricky, we're going to talk about them together, let's take a, a look overall at, at, at what we have here at this molecule. This obviously is the hemoglobin molecule. We have four different subunits represented by different colors. We have alpha chains, which could be the red uh, uh, units. We have beta chains as the blue. What type of protein structure does that uh, give hemoglobin? That's a question you want to be thinking about. 
And then also you notice here these, these green structures. We have one of these green structures in each uh, of our areas of the hemoglobin molecule. These, of course, are the heme subunits where oxygen binds. But a question to ask yourself that is directly relevant to our discussion is, is that where CO2 will bind also? Is that where H plus will bind? And no, that's not the case. So what we want to think about is the importance of allosteric binding, that O2 and CO2 do not bind hemoglobin at the same site. However, the binding of O2 to hemoglobin and likewise CO2 to hemoglobin indirectly affects the binding of the other. This is classic allosteric uh, interaction as opposed to competitive interaction. So now that we've reviewed a lot of that content, we're in a better position to answer this actually quite challenging step on question. And this gets to another uh, point that is important to make. It's a little paradoxical, but we see it a lot on the USMLE. Questions that are short, that maybe seem like they're, they're more straightforward, tend to be more complicated than we might think. Conversely, we've seen a number of times that questions that with long vignettes, very long vignettes, lots of labs and imaging and whatnot, are actually not that hard in the end. So this is, a, is going to be a very tricky question. Once again, the question is what effect best explains why venous blood can carry more carbon dioxide than arterial blood for a given PCO2. So let's look at the choices in order. Choice A, venous blood contains a higher concentration of hemoglobin than arterial blood. Hmm. How does that sound? Well, it shouldn't sound good. It should sound like nonsense, in fact. It is true that the gas levels change, CO2 content, O2 content, but hemoglobin is a function of protein in a red blood cell. And there is nothing about the transition from the arterial to the, to the, the venous side via the capillary bed that should change the amount of hemoglobin. So we're going to get rid of choice A. That doesn't make any sense at all. All right, so let's move on to question B, to, to answer choice B. Deoxyhemoglobin does not bind 2,3-BPG as avidly as oxyhemoglobin. Well, this actually is, is a pretty attractive answer choice for many students. Why do I say that? I say that because 2,3-BPG is an important substance in the cell. 2,3-BPG is a metabolic by byproduct of metabolism in the red blood cell. And there are many important implications that are tested on the USMLE. So a student who is not paying attention or a student who is uh, understandably confused by this question might gravitate to 2,3-BPG and assume that this is the correct answer because that student recognizes this substance. But that is not a good thing to do. And if we read the choice, we realize that it's actually the opposite case. We can bring in our outside knowledge and know that 2,3-BPG will actually uh, bind deoxyhemoglobin more tightly than oxyhemoglobin. So it's an opposite, and that's incorrect. Okay, so we've gotten rid of two choices here. Let's keep going. If you look at choice C, and it says deoxyhemoglobin has a lower capacity to bind uh, to form carbamino compounds than oxyhemoglobin. So deoxyhemoglobin is less able to bind carbon dioxide than oxyhemoglobin. And based on everything that we talked about in our discussion with the graphs, this, again, is the opposite of what's true. Because of that allosteric interplay, the deoxyhemoglobin is more able to bind to carbon dioxide, is more able to bind to H+. So once again, we see this classic wrong answer pathology, which is opposite. And opposite can be very attractive on the USMLE. But in this case, we're not going to fall for it. So we've gotten rid of three choices here. Now let's look at the fourth one. Oh, no. What do we see here? Deoxyhemoglobin has a lower pKa than oxyhemoglobin. Lower pKa, oh my god, pKa, well, what's going on here? Bring back the biochemistry. This is going to make a typical student a little anxious, understandably. Some students will respond to that anxiety, will deal with it by picking the answer choice. Oh, it must be pKa because I recognize that. But just as that was not a good strategy with choice B, that's not a good strategy here with choice D. And in fact, pKa has nothing to do or little to do with what we're talking about. So let's get rid of that as well. Now we're down to two choices. We're down to E and F. Let's look at E. Deoxyhemoglobin is a better buffer of hydrogen ions than oxyhemoglobin. Hmm, pKa buffers, you know, we're, we're back in Orgo lab here, what's going on? Maybe, uh, who knows, who knows? So we're going to hold off on E, even though it sounds a little fishy. Let's look at F. Oxygen and carbon dioxide compete for the same binding site on hemoglobin. Wait a second, that's not true. 
we just talked about how O2 and CO2 bind at different sites. What's the term for that? Allosteric, allosteric interplay. So whether or not F is related, we know it's a false statement, therefore it cannot be true. And once again, by process of elimination, we're left with E. Deoxyhemoglobin is a better buffer of hydrogen ions. But we're not satisfied with that. But what is this buffer business? We have to understand this principle because it's widely applicable to other cases. In order to understand that, we're going to look back at our uh, figure that we had from before. This was our summary figure of the carbonic anhydrase equation in the red cell. And let's go to the end part of our discussion from before. We said that H plus ion, once it's created, will stay in the red blood cell and be bound to hemoglobin. And we said the benefit of that is by sequestering the, heme the H plus, the bicarb is allowed to be produced. We're able to drive the reaction to the right. So could we say that the hemoglobin is buffering H plus by binding it? Hmm, that's an interesting way of looking at it, but it's exactly true. And this leads to another important way to think about this question. Whenever we want to understand the effect of something, we can think about it by understanding the absence of that thing. Well, that means what if hemoglobin were not there? In that case, H plus might start accumulating in the cell. And when H plus accumulates in the cell, that's not good. Remember, where is H plus typically found in most cells? What organelle? And if you're thinking lysosomes, you're entirely correct. And then you're also thinking, well, why is H plus uh, sequestered in the lysosome? Why is it restricted to that area? And the answer is, if it were not, it would lower the pH of cells. It would denature vital proteins. It would mess up the structural integrity of the cell, and it would be total chaos. And the same idea can be had here. If hemoglobin were not there to take the H plus away, the H plus would accumulate, and we would get denaturing of the cell. So hemoglobin is helping the cell to resist changes in pH. In other words, it's acting as a buffer. And of course, if we didn't have hemoglobin and H plus were high, we also would not be able to capitalize on Le Chatelier's. We would not be able to drive the reaction to the right, producing more bicarb. That would mean a lower level of bicarb in the serum. And if bicarb is an analog for CO2 levels, that would mean lower CO2. So that is the principle that's going on over here, and that's very important to understand. We can make a connection. One last thing we're going to talk about here is, well, how does this happen in the kidney? We said that this carbonic anhydrase mechanism is not limited to the red blood cell. It also occurs in the kidney as well as the eye. But well, where in the kidney does this occur? Some of you may remember that in the proximal tubule, which is this uh, area over here near the glomerulus, all the bicarb, or much of the bicarb that's filtered needs to be reabsorbed. Well, how are we going to get a charged molecule to go across the uh, tubular membrane? Charged molecules typically cannot diffuse across membranes. And the solution that's devised physiologically is to turn the bicarb back into CO2. So we have high levels of carbonic anhydrase in the proximal tubular cells, and that allows us to go in the reverse direction and reabsorb our bicarbonate. One final clinical point, which is a high-level point, this is for 240-plus scores or aspiring scores. What happens in a situation of severe acidosis? Let's say a patient has, uh, is, is in starvation mode. Let's say they have DKA. Maybe they have sepsis. Maybe they're an older patient with sepsis. How does the body get rid of all that acid that's produced? Well, one key mechanism to do that is by having the kidneys excrete more. But there's an issue. There's an issue that has to be dealt with. If we have all this acid in the urine, uh, urinary uh, tubular lumen, that would denature the, the urinary cells, and that would be extremely painful for, for us. Just like if H plus accumulated in the red cell, that would denature the red cell proteins. So how do we get rid of that H plus? We produce something called titratable uh, acids. So in a situation of acidosis, you'll have a lot of NH3, you'll have a lot of other uh, weak bases that can take on a proton. And that's not just an obscure point. That is a heavily tested point on the USMLE. And we want you to be able to connect that idea of buffering, that the ammonia will buffer the acid in a case of acidosis. We want you to be able to connect that to this case over here with hemoglobin buffering acid, because they are essentially the same idea. Wow, that was a lot to consider. You guys did great to hang in there. We're at the very end here, and as always, we want to present additional questions for us to consider. Our discussion was reasonably in-depth, but there are, of course, many more things. 
that you might consider or discuss with a tutor during a tutoring session or look up on your own. One thing is, well, what happens to patients who are, who are hypoventilating or hyperventilating? And what drugs trigger hypoventilation? Very, very high yield point on the USMLE. We would also want to think about what other factors change the, the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. Specifically, how does carbon monoxide affect the curve? Another frequently tested point on the USMLE. Other things to think about are how we interpret an ABG. What is a drug that mimics or what is a drug that helps us dump excess bicarb in the kidney? Uh, what is the effect of CO2 on blood vessels in the brain? All of these are key points that span all the systems, but of course beyond the scope of tonight's discussion. And finally, a little information about med school tutors. As always, at med school tutors, you know, we are the leader in one-on-one -on -one medical tutoring test preparation. We've been that for a number of years. What do we do? Well, we help aspiring physicians to craft personal study schedules, which balance review, retention, and practice. We target particular weaknesses by tailoring specific uh, schedules to the student and only focusing on the areas where the student needs, needs help. One of the most important things we do is refine clinical reasoning. And that's something we mention every single time because it is so essential to the mission of med school tutors. Yes, we want you to score the best that you can on the USMLE. Yes, we want you to achieve your dreams, to get into the residency of your choice. All those are worthy and essential goals. But just as important is the need to improve your clinical reasoning because becoming a better thinker of medicine will allow you to become a better practitioner of medicine. And these two uh, dual objectives, improving test taking skills, scoring high, and also improving general medical reasoning, these can be accomplished in tandem. We strongly believe that and we uh, train all of our tutors to put that into practice. Finally, managing the pressure of intensive preparation. These exams are stressful. We know we've been there recently, and we hope you get through it. For more information about Med School Tutors, we invite you, as always, to visit our website at www.medschooltutors.com. For uh, specific questions to get answered, we ask you to email us at scorehigh at medschooltutors.com. We'd be happy to answer your questions and also set you up with a complimentary consultation. And that is it. Thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. We hope that you now come away with a, a new appreciation of hemoglobin and, and gas transport. We hope that you understand what we're trying to do, to do, putting together different concepts across different systems. That is the same process you should undertake on your own. And we hope that we'll see you again at future webinars. Thank you very much and good night.